Okay, hi everyone. Uh, so today we are uh, reviewing for Friday's exam. Um, and uh, after this uh, review session, I'll go ahead and post um, these uh, slides uh, to make it available uh, for you. Although it should be said, none of these slides are any new slides, right? All of these are coming from our lectures. Um, but the purpose of our review today is to kind of just help you um, maybe have some perspective on all the topics that we've covered. So you can already sort of sense as you're beginning your, your studying for Friday, um, sort of like an outline of the different topics that we've covered and to be aware, right? That you need to budget yourself time in order to um, go over them. Because of course I don't have time to go over every single lecture. Uh, and in fact, that would be uh, not very enjoyable at all, right? Um, okay. So uh, I did show you this slide last time when I began to give you a heads up about what the exam is going to be like. Um, so it's going to cover lectures one through 12. So here we are in week five. Here we are today, Wednesday. Um, so everything about the innate immune system, both the immediate side of the immune system, the induced side of the immune system. And then we start talking about uh, our adaptive immune system, B cells, like what a B cell is all about. Um, and the process of B cells making immunoglobulins, right, which is super important because that's the whole basis of why a B cell is a B cell. Uh, and then we shifted over to looking at T cells uh, and how um, T cells with their T cell receptor in many ways are kind of similar and parallel to B cells, but in many ways they are very different in terms of their function. Um, and we've been learning about we're trying to get a picture about why B cells and T cells both are important and how they work together. So as a reminder, you do have your quiz for this week, the quiz on chapter five. Um, well, this is the slide from, from Monday, so it's available now. Uh, and I think I mentioned to you that the way I've set up the quiz is so that when you submit it, you'll be able to see the answer key right away. Uh, that's because the quiz is meant to help you study and prepare and, and know what, um, you know, what uh, maybe certain questions that you need to brush up on, right? But at the same time, I reminded you, please don't go and share the answer key to class with classmates who haven't yet taken the quiz, because uh, you're actually doing them a disservice, because you will then not encourage them to sort of uh, review the stuff on their own. All right, so here we are today, review session. Exam one is this Friday. Um, I have prepared an announcement in La Lima. I will send it out today. I decided to hold off on doing it because I found in the past that uh, if I send an announcement out too early, um, students get around, don't get around to taking it seriously and reading it, okay? But I will post an announcement with the details of how the exam will work um, later today. All right, but again, the short, story of that is you'll just be logging on to La Lima on Friday at lecture time, so 1230, right? You don't have to worry about Zoom, right? Because I'm not going to be hanging out somehow sitting there pretending like I can actually see you or something, right? Uh, that's kind of pointless. Just get on to La Lima at 1230 on Friday. And at 1230, the exam will appear, all right? Because I think before then, it's, it's uh, not open. So I think you don't even see it. All right, so don't freak out if you don't see it, but at 1230, it'll appear, um, it'll open up and you just go ahead and take it. And so it's a 50 question, multiple choice, um, pick the best response, A through D, um, and you have 50 minutes to do it in, okay? Uh, so once you click begin, right, your, the counter will start. So the exam will be available for a, a window of one hour from 1230 to 130. But within that time, right, you have to make sure to click start. And at the moment you click start, then you have 50 minutes. That means you can log on and start as late as 1240, right? And you'd still have 50 minutes before you get to 130 and the, and the um, exam closes. All right. So look for that info in the details. Uh, and importantly, for those students who are making use of COCUA services, please contact me so I can confirm that I actually have your name on the list from COCUA, because without that official um, list from COCUA, I cannot grant you any type of time extensions, okay? Because that's just to keep it fair um, for all students. All right, okay. So let's go ahead and review. 
Uh, so, so far this semester, we've been really sort of uh, going over the basics of these different cells and proteins that are involved in our immune system. We spent a considerable amount of time starting off the semester uh, appreciating our innate side of our immune system, the site that comes pre-programmed, right? Built in, ready to go. And this involves cells that do certain functions and more or less always perform their same functions as part of what they do for fighting um, invading pathogens, right? As part of our built-in modest to maintain uh, side of our immune system. Uh, so be familiar with some of the functions of things like neutrophils, macrophages, dendritic cells. Uh, we have not spent much time talking about things like eosinophils, basophils, and mast cells, uh, but you should at least be familiar that they are part of our innate system. Then we moved on and spent a lot of time looking at our adaptive immune system, right? That involve things like our small lymphocytes, B cells and T cells, right? And also how as part of the development of our adaptive immune system evolutionarily, that's where the NK cells came from, right? So NK cells that actually function more like innate effectors, because again, they uh, go around looking for certain signals that they are pre-programmed uh, to identify, right? And that's in contrast to things like T cells and B cells, which are the newer evolutionary improvements, new inventions right, of our immune system to be able to adapt and actually recognize some sort of um, foreign pathogen signal like a three-dimensional molecule on the surface of a pathogen or released by a pathogen that our pre-programmed innate effector cells and pre-programmed effector, innate effector proteins, things like complement proteins, maybe do a lousy job of being able to detect, right? And we said that we have to have an adaptive immune system because our species, right, compared to life on earth, we are pretty long lived. We live for decades and we're made of trillions of cells, right? So we have to have some way to actually deal with the inevitable occurrence of a new type of pathogen that our body has not seen before um, infecting us, right? Not only our body has never seen before, but maybe the human species has not seen before, right? Things like the SARS-CoV-2, right? If we did not have an adaptive immune system all of those hundreds and hundreds of millions of people uh, around the planet who get infected with COVID, uh, with SARS, uh, with uh, COVID-19, right? Everybody would die without an adaptive immune system. Okay, that's a scary thought, right? But that's why we have an adaptive immune system so that we can have a chance to fight back and recover, right? All right, so... Um, this slide is kind of a composite of several slides put together. Since we're doing this as a review, I don't feel as bad giving you this super busy slide because it's meant to be a bunch of things together in one place for you to take your time, review and understand. Right? So we said that uh, if this point over here is the moment you're infected by something like this particular novel pathogen, right? Uh, well, let's say for right now, it doesn't necessarily have to be a novel pathogen. Any pathogen, like a bacteria here, right? This hot dog with little bumps on it. Uh, and then on the x-axis would be time, right? In hours and days and even weeks that pass. And on the y-axis is just kind of this made up sort of set of units where we're just measuring your immune response, right? In other words, how active is your immune system? And more importantly, how active are different parts of your immune system? So we said that from the moment infection happens, we can follow this uh, gray line as being the load of pathogen in your tissues. So the bacteria starts to replicate, so levels of pathogen begin to go up. Right away, your immediate innate effectors go to work, right? So that's what this dotted blue line here, right? So things like macrophages right away start ramping up, okay? And um, they begin to plateau out, plateauing meaning this is about you know, as many, as high a level of activity as you can get just with things like the macrophages and the complement proteins that happen to be on that spot of your arm where you got the cut and the bacteria, the little red bumpy hot dogs are going in, right? If those work, 
then maybe within after a few hours, right, the pathogen load up here that was building up comes crashing down as your macrophages and complement proteins succeed, right? And as a result, the blue dotted line, which is the activity of your immediate response, um, goes down as well, right? And then that's it, right? So the majority of time when you're talking about a scrape, a paper cut, you know, you get poked by a pin, you step on a on a spiky uh, stick or something like that. That's what happens, right? Within a few hours, it's done, right? You never even occurs to you that your life is somehow being jeopardized or threatened, right? And by the evening, you know, the threat is neutralized and you don't even think about it again. However, in the background, what is happening, right? Because these macrophages, as they start eating the bacteria, they start sending out cytokine messages. So the cytokine messages begin to float away from that spot in your arm into your blood and start going through your system. But, you know, the cytokine messages are still pretty low and they're going up and up and up. But in the background, they're starting to do something. What is that? They're starting to attract and activate things like neutrophils, right? Neutrophils that are part of our induced um, innate side of our immune system. But the point is, as things like neutrophils and maybe natural killer cells start paying attention to these cytokines going up, you know, they are the dotted line. If after a few hours, your macrophages and complement proteins took care of everything, then what happens? The macrophages stop sending out any more cytokines, right? Because they've stopped eating any more bacteria. So the cytokine levels drop. And as a result, the orange dotted line also drops. It's kind of like your induced response never really gained enough traction to take off, right? But it was starting in the background. However, so immediate response is the responsibility of macrophages and complement proteins, right? The induced response is a combination of macrophages, complement proteins, and now these recruited you know, the orange line cells like neutrophils and natural killer cells, right? If your immediate response doesn't take care of the job and the pathogen load here keeps going up and up and up beyond a few hours, and now we're talking about a day later, two days later, right? That orange dotted line keeps going up because the cytokine levels keep going up as long as there's bacteria, right? And as long as there's macrophages eating the bacteria, and as long as cells continue to get infected, there are going to be, um, uh, cytokines going up, up, up. And that's what finally gets your induced response really kicked in, right? All of a sudden now you have a lot of neutrophils being released from your bone marrow. You, they're going through their blood, they're exiting your blood into the tissue and they're helping out natural killer cells as well. Hopefully that combination then of the recruited induced effectors working together in the background with those same immediate macrophages and complement proteins, right? Those together then maybe after a few days succeed, right? And uh, maybe at this point is when you're really starting to feel kind of sick though, right? Because those are the really then the symptoms that you have an infection going on, right? Uh, importantly, if they cannot take care of the pathogen, right? And the pathogen keeps building up in levels, that's when after let's say a week or so, right? Your adaptive immune response finally gets fully activated because this is the heavy hitters, right? The SWAT team that needs to be brought in. Your immune system didn't want to do this if it didn't have to, but now it's pretty clear that your innate side of your system is not enough to deal with this. You have no choice but to wake up your lymphocytes uh, and your adaptive immune response uh, because you know what? You're dying, right? So you gotta go ahead and wake that up. And so that's what this pink line is, right? So now on top of all of the, the innate effectors, you now have things like B cells being chosen, T cells being chosen, antibodies being made, et cetera. Okay, so talk your way through this because I think if you can really feel comfortable understanding these shifting events and things like that contained in this picture, you already have a great foundation for understanding all of the nitty gritty details um, of these cells and proteins that we study. Right. So let's start off with looking at the complement proteins and review. Remember, complement proteins are a whole family of small soluble proteins um, that attach to the surfaces of things like pathogens. Uh, 
out of the 30 or so different complement proteins, probably the most important for our discussion at least is complement C3, right? Because complement C3, when it gets activated, it forms C3B, C3B that can then stick to the surface um, of a pathogen and start building uh, a convertase complex. Right? So, so a convertase complex simply is C3B with a complement protein B that has come along and attached and that complement protein B itself has been cleaved and activated. So only the BB part of it sticks on there. And the C3B BB is what we call the alternative C3 convertase because it's going to then take any other C3s that float by, make C3B out of them and stick the C3B onto the surface, right? And so that's how you then get a very fast spreading of opsonization with C3B uh, on the target. So that's all our alternative pathway. And even though it's called the alternative pathway, it is the first one to act, right? Uh, then we have two delayed pathways here. The second one to act is the lectin pathway. So this involves if after several hours or a couple of day, you're actually getting into your recruited induced immune response now. Remember that includes things like physiological changes in your tissues like the liver and your liver hepatocyte cells begin to produce different types of acute phase proteins whose job it is, is to really help out with this opsonization that up until now you're, you've been doing a lousy job at, right? Because let's say, figure it this way. If you weren't doing a lousy job at it up until now, there would be no reason you got to this point where you're entering now this acute phase response and having the induced response happen, right? So things like C-reactive protein or mannose binding lectins are produced in suddenly high, high levels by the cells of your liver. They go through the blood. They help to stick to the surface of the pathogen and help complement proteins stick, right? So remember C4 and C4B is the result of the lectin pathway, uh, but this convertase, right, its target is still complement protein C3s that are floating by, right? So its job is still to put more C3Bs on the surface. And then the most delayed one is the classical pathway, right? So um, the classical pathway then, uh, requires things like antibodies. So C-reactive protein is often also considered part of the classical pathway. Um, but really what we're talking about are antibodies, right? So antibodies would not come around until a week later or more, right? Assuming this is the first time you've been exposed to this, you know, to bad clown, right? Um, so the antibodies will be produced by B cells and those antibodies will help with the creation of classical C3 convertases, right? Also by recruiting things like C4, C2A, so that it can now help more C3Bs get onto the surface. Um, keep in mind though, that even though we say this is the most delayed out of the three, that's only if this is the very first time you've been exposed to bad clown, right? Then it fits this kind of delayed pattern. If in reality, you've beaten bad clown before, you will have the immune memory of bad clown. So you will already have um, anti-bad clown aminoglobulins and antibodies present in your system, in which case the antibodies will really right away help out with the alternative pathway, right? So they will already um, help out um, well, no, I shouldn't say they help out with the alternative pathway. They make the classical pathway happen much sooner, right? Practically immediately, if you already have the antibodies. Importantly, keep in mind that all three of these pathways, it's all about complement C3 activation and C3B fixation on the surface of the pathogens. So be familiar with the uh, pathways of C3 activation. Um, remember, we saw this really early in the semester, and I think I'm glad that it didn't scare half the class off, because I think now you realize, right, that not all of the pathways we study are this complicated, but it's also important that you understood what's happening here, since this is the critical part of what immediately starts happening when you have virus or bacteria uh, enter your tissue, right? So remember, the alternative three C3 convertase can either lead to the fixation of more C3B, and 
this C3B convertase as it's adding more C3Bs in, it keeps going, right? And not only that, but each one of these C3Bs now can recruit its own yellow uh, factor B and become its own convertase. So that's why all of a sudden there's like this explosion of opsonization, super rapid. Or remember another way this could go is some of the C3B convertase complexes might actually end up while they're still hanging on to the C3B in that moment of molecular time, right, where the C3B hasn't popped off of it yet and got fixed to the surface, it can recruit complement C5. And C5B then that gets activated goes on to form our membrane attack complexes, right, along with complement protein C6 through C9, and it pokes all these holes like Swiss cheese in, in the pathogen, causing the pathogen to lyse. So we studied um, cytokines. So remember, cytokines are special small proteins that are made by cells and released by cells to kind of float away in this cloud of cytokines in order to signal other cells that recognize these cytokines, right? So whatever cell is in the receiving end, this cloud of cytokines, you know, it's going through the cloud it has to have cytokine receptors on a surface. And th those cells are meant to be the ones that receive these signals, right? So when a macrophage is eating the hot dogs, right, it stimulates it to release these different cytokines. Certain cytokines uh, induce inflammation. And so those cytokines are called interleukins, right? So any of those IL uh, proteins, interleukin proteins, um, they help encourage inflammation to happen, right? And inflammation is important. I brought this up to you before. You know, we often think about, oh, if you get a cut, right? And a couple of days later, you're looking at it, you're like, ow, right? It's, it's looking kind of red and puffy. It's maybe a little firm to the touch and warm, right? Usually in the past, you would have said, oh, uh oh, it got infected, right? But now that you're, you know, budding immunologists here, you realize, no, technically the infection happened the moment, days ago, the bacteria got into your uh, tissue. Really what you're seeing now, right, is the failure of your immediate immune system to deal with the infection. So now you're seeing the result of your induced response taking place, right, which involves the release of cytokines causing changes in your tissue that include um, leaky blood vessels to be able to encourage um, more things to be able to exit from your blood, like more complement proteins or whole cells, like more monocytes that can turn into um, more macrophages, neutrophils have an easier time getting out of your blood if the walls of your blood vessel become leaky, right? And the raising of temperature is part of trying to make it uncomfortable for things like the virus or the bacteria to replicate, right? So you're trying to slow down the replication, right? So inflammation is a very important side effect of your immune system acting. So what I emphasized to you before is that maybe previously you thought, oh, it's those germs, right? They're making me have this red puffy, um, you know, uh, response. No, right? It's your immune system that's doing it, right? So it's an interesting way of thinking about it, right? Those symptoms that we're all used to seeing, right, are actually our immune system fighting back, and then involves cytokine signals. So we looked at some examples here um, and uh, we began to discuss how certain interleukins, for example, CXCL8 or IL8, uh, play a very important role in recruiting things like neutrophils, right? So here's a neutrophil that got released by your bone marrow. It's been cruising around inside your blood. And remember, I kind of gave you this story of imagining what it'd be like if you were one of these cells zooming around inside your your circulatory system, what would it look like, right? Well, you know, I don't know. I mean, you're either in a big tunnel or a small tunnel and there's a fork in the tunnel and then you go into this tunnel, right? How do you actually know where you've ended up in the body? How do you know that you're passing by the lungs, passing by your, your liver, right? Importantly, how does an immune cell know that it's actually really close to the site of infection so that it needs to stop and leave the blood to go help out, right? So we said that uh, that's all taken care of by different combinations of receptors on the surface of something like a neutrophil and different cell surface proteins that become expressed or displayed um, when cells, for example, these purple endothelial cells, which are the inner lining 
of your blood vessels, right? If they're close to the site of infection, then these purple endothelial cells are receiving all kinds of cytokine messages that stimulate them to start making these proteins here, right? Like this one sticking up here or this one sticking up here. So those are what allow the neutrophils to stick and slow down, come to a halt, and then certain interleukins like IL-8 or CXCL-8 that are being made by macrophages that are not shown on this slide because the macrophages might be below the slide here, right, in the tissue fighting the bacteria, right, sending out a cloud of these green CXCL-8s. The neutrophils have the right receptor protein, CXCL8 receptor, so that they're sort of sniffing out, right? They smell something good. That's what I said. And they follow their nose, right? That's what encourages them to squeeze out of the blood, um, out of the wall of the capillary into the tissue. And they'll follow, right? This, this gradient, right? Following their nose, the stronger and stronger concentrations of CXCL8 will, will allow them or guide them to the site of the infection. So be familiar with those different neutrophil receptors and the different uh, proteins that engage with them as part of encouraging neutrophil function. Right? We also examined how a lot of times immune cells work together through direct contact um, and they help each other out. Right? So for example, NK cells, which are these cytotoxic cells, remember NK cells are the first example in the evolution of our immune system of more of an adaptive side, right? Even though they still function as innate uh, cells because NK cells now, they're not concerned with directly eating or directly destroying a virus particle or a bacteria particle, right? Because that very direct sort of way of doing things is what our macrophages and neutrophils, dendritic cells kind of do as part of their innate immune function, right? Natural killer cells, right, their focus is identifying cells in our body that have become infected with the pathogen and putting a stop to the spread of the pathogen by telling that infected cell to die, right? So you tell a virus infected cell just to go ahead and basically die and implode before it's had a chance to release thousands of new virus particles, right? As we will learn later, natural killer cells also help identify cells in our body that are diseased, right? Something's really wrong with the cell, right? And it's better to tell that cell, you know what? Don't try to fight it. Just go ahead and take yourself out of the picture here because it's better for the survival of our whole organism, right? if some of these cells that look a little funny, just take themselves out of the picture. So here we have a natural killer cell that's not activated yet, it's just floating around, right? And it receives CXCL8 messages, just like neutrophils can sniff this out, right? NK cells also do. And when the NK cell comes, it finds, oh, it's a macrophage that's sending out the IL-8. And the reason the macrophage is sending out the IL-8 is because it's busy eating virus particles, right? So now the NK cell synapses, it presses up against the target cell, in this case, the macrophage, right? and the macrophage then sends it IL-12 signals, IL-12 and IL-15 that now stimulate the natural killer cell to start waking up, right? So these little dots that start appearing in it are all these little vesicles that are now filling up with these cytotoxic messages. These messages are the thing that when they're then released on another target cell, will tell that target cell to undergo apoptosis and die, right? So the NK cell wakes up, it begins to make copies of itself. And in exchange, right, the NK cell starts making interferon gamma, the little orange um, cytokine that's received by the macrophage, right? So this is a two-way conversation. The macrophage tells the NK cell, hey, check this out. You know, I'm eating viruses here. So I think you better wake up because something's going on. We have a virus infection going on. And then when the natural killer cell wakes up, it goes off and starts doing its job, right? Now it's, now it's active. It's going to try to find other cells that are infected by virus and tell them to die. But the natural killer cell in exchange talks back and tells the macrophage, you are doing a good job, right? You're doing all the right things, but you need to really ramp it up now. Okay, so the macrophage in response, it receives the interferon gamma. And now suddenly, right, it starts eating a lot more viruses 
um, and it does its job more efficiently. So this idea of back and forth communication between different cells is a very important concept on how our immune system coordinates different uh, defense efforts. So talking about interferons, we talked about how virus infected cells release these special cytokines called interferons, right? And the name interferon, um, yeah, it's a nice name because early researchers saw that if you had these proteins present, they interfere with the spread of a virus infection, right? And the interferon messages are received not only by the same cell that sends it out, in which case you have sort of a autocrine signaling, right? But more importantly, neighboring cells that have not been infected yet, right? These interferon messages give them a heads up, a heads up that says, hey, you know, I, I've gotten, inf I've been infected by a virus, right? So you guys better do something to try to make sure you guys don't get infected either, right? So these interferon responses result in things like the cells changing some of their cell biology that can do things like slow down the rate of protein production, right? Or slow down, um, different types of endocytic activities. So its membrane can actually change a little bit to make it harder for viruses to infect it. Or even if the viruses do still infect it, the machinery inside of the cell is kind of slowed down so that the virus can't as successfully hijack it and make it and force it to make more virus particles. All right. So then we got shifted squarely into our adaptive immune system. So we started off by looking at B cells, and we said that B cells have on their surface B cell receptors, which are these protein molecules that we call immunoglobulins, right? So immunoglobulins are these Y-shaped proteins. They're glycoproteins. They're made up of protein and these little sugar groups on them. You do not need to know, you know, the position of these sugar groups, okay? Because I don't even know the position of these sugar groups. And to be honest, I don't even know if this cartoon is accurate, right? But the whole point is these are glycoproteins, right? Because they are a combination of proteins that have certain sugar modifications on them. Importantly, what you do need to know, right? As part of this Y structure, an immunoglobulin is made of four peptide chains, right? Four, port, four protein chains, two identical heavy chains and two identical light chains, okay? Uh, remember that there are five different isotypes or classes of immunoglobulin, IgG, M, D, A, and E. And the difference between them is that even though one B cell has the capability of making any of these five, right? And in fact, a given B cell may be told to make any of these five, right? Depending upon what's needed in order to best fight the pathogen infection, that single B cell right, will always make them with the exact same um, antigen binding domains. Right? So if a B cell is first making IgM, which all B cells first make, right? and its IgM shape gets chosen, and that B cell is then told, hey, why don't you turn into a plasma cell and instead of IgM, make IgG, right? It can make the IgG form of this so that the stem part of the immunoglobulin is different, right? Because it uses these blue constant gamma blocks instead of the blue constant mu blocks Right? And that means the stem is different so that the IgG has slightly different properties than the IgM. But importantly, that B cell will still maintain the same uh, antigen binding domain. Because after all, that's the whole purpose of how the B cell was chosen, right? Some of those B cells that uh, are chosen, right, after they begin to make perfect copies of themselves and some of them become plasma cells, others will of course undergo hypermutation to try to improve and modify the fit of this antigen binding domain. But the still, same principle still applies, right? Once a B cell has revised uh, or through hypermutation come up with a slightly better version of that antigen binding domain, right? At that point, no matter which of the five classes of immunoglobulins it's told to make, right? It's going to have that same uh, antigen binding domain that it refined, okay? Remember the free floating version of a B cell receptor is what we call an antibody, right? So it's no longer stuck to the surface of the B cell, it's released once the B cell becomes a plasma cell and starts making this alternate form of the Ig that's soluble. Yeah. 
Remember that the uh, variable domain of each arm of a Y-shaped uh, immunoglobulin is actually two chains that contributed to it, right? A heavy chain and then the light chain. And it's the combination of the ends of the heavy chain and the light chain on each arm that make the complete antigen recognizing surface. So this is just looking at the end of, let's say, a light chain, right? And it has three variable loops in it. These are loops that vary dramatically in amino acid sequence, right? So these three combined with, if we were to pretend that this is pressed up against the end of a heavy chain down here, the heavy chain end would look very similar to this. It would also have three variable loops, right? And so the six combined variable loops is what determines the three-dimensional shape that makes this particular uh, immunoglobulin unique at the end. And remember those loops, the hypervariable loop one and two, that just comes about by which V block is chosen during VDJ recombination, right? But the third loop, the HV3, is more a function of that kind of random process of um, DNA repair that helps join these different segments that the big oven mitt chose, right? The oven, the oven mitt, the RAG recombinase complex, chose this particular red V block and this particular yellow J block out of maybe like 30 choices of red block and also many choices of J block. And the DNA was cut in order to bring these two blocks together. The process of rejoining the cut DNA, remember it's like the, the rope that I showed you, right? When these are brought together by the oven mitt, you have a whole loop of rope sticking out. That's everything in between, right? That loop is gonna get cut off and lost. Then the rope needs to be stitched back together again, right? Uh, I mean, think about this. If that rope doesn't get stitched back together again, what does that represent? That literally represents your chromosome falling into two pieces, right? I mean, that's kind of freaky, but think about it, right? Because after all, what we're talking about is this one continuous chain, one single molecule of DNA, that's your chromosome, where this VDJ recombination is happening, right? Like on chromosome 2, 22, or chromosome 14. You got to stitch that back together again. And so it's a random process of adding random DNA bases. And so that means the resulting gene that got put together by these different fragments, red block, yellow block, green block, if we're talking about heavy chain, right? When that thing gets transcribed into, into RNA, um, right, it's going to contain a little piece of sequence that you were not born with, right? This B cell has come up with a new little piece of your genome that you were not born with. And that's part of this protein now, or, or is reflected in the amino acid sequence of this protein. All right, so review the process of VDJ recombination. Remember that um, this happens through uh, this process of the uh, 1223 rule. Each one of these colored blocks is flanked on either side by these conserved DNA sequences, these heptamers and nonomers that are spaced apart by either 12 or 23, uh, you know, could be any DNA bases that those are the non-important parts. The important part is the spacing, right? 12 apart and 23 apart is what enables the RAG protein complex to properly bind to them and thereby choosing which green block here, D block and which yellow J block come together and everything else between them gets lost. Right, so it'll cut the rope, and the rope has to get stitched together. Um, so review this concept. I know it's a hard concept, but hopefully these types of uh, examples with the rope and the oven mitt help out. Right. So then we said, okay, what about T cells? Right, we said B cells that kind of come up with their own cookie recipe for their own immunoglobulin, they'll first make IgM form of it on their surface, right? And some IgD, but we didn't really get into that too much at this time. They have IgM on their surface and then these B cells go to work. And then these B cells, if they are lucky enough that their unique um, Ig shape on the ends actually ends up binding something like pathogen, right? The antigen from the pathogen, um, then ultimately this B cell may end up being chosen to become a plasma cell, right? So this is the whole B cell's goal in life is to be one of the lucky chosen ones and to be told to become a plasma cell so it can make antibody versions of the immunoglobulin that it knows how to make, right? Based upon its cookie recipe. 
we said T cells also have a unique receptor on their surface, right? The, T the TCR or T cell receptor. But the difference is this never gets made as a free floating soluble form. The TCR always stays on the T cell receptor, right? And why? Because the job of the T cell is to do something to the target cell, right? The target cell that is presenting the signal that this blue TC T cell with its TCR recognizes. So here you have a number of T cells attacking or checking out a potential cell. And depending upon if this T cell is a killer T cell or a helper T cell, the fate of this yellow cell that they're checking out, you know, will be very different, right? So very important, get it clear in your mind that B cells and T cells share some similarities because they both make unique antigen binding molecules on their surface based upon VDJ recombination to kind of cook up their own recipe for it. But how those um, receptors are used are very different, right? In B cells, they eventually can become antibodies, right? And think about it this way, the whole point is the plasma cell that makes a big cloud of antibodies, those antibodies go flowing through your body everywhere, right? Whereas the, the plasma cell itself that's making them doesn't have to be everywhere, right? Because the plasma cell itself doesn't really care about seeing what cells its antibodies are attacking, right? It just makes the antibodies and the antibodies do their job on their own. Whereas with the T cell receptor, right? the T cell needs to be there to see what cell is actually presenting um, the peptide that it's getting excited about or that it's T cell receptor is getting excited about because that's the only way it makes sense because then that T cell knows what cell to either kill or to help, right? So remember with T cell receptor, TCRs can only bind to peptides, right? That's another way it's very different than immunoglobulins on B cells. Immunoglobulins and antibodies can bind peptides, they can bind carbohydrates, they can bind lipids, they can bind anything that just fits their three-dimensional structure at the end of their Y-shaped IG arms, right? T cell receptor is different. They're limited to just binding small pieces of protein, small peptides that are between eight and 15 amino acids long, right? And the other important thing is these peptides are not just floating around bumping into the T cell receptor they have to be presented to the T cell receptor, right? On the surface of whatever cell it's going to target. And we said that depending upon whether that cell presents peptide using MHC class two or MHC class one determines what kind of T cell helper or killer will respond, right? So remember MHC class two, is if you have a particular type of immune cell, like a macrophage dendritic cell or a B cell, that as part of its job is taking in on purpose evidence of the pathogen into its, into its um, inside the cell, right? It'll do so by keeping that in special vesicles, special vesicles that then are where MHC2 platforms get loaded up, right? And then those MHC2 go to the surface and are now displaying the little red dot, the little short amino acid, oh, eight to 10 or 15 amino acid uh, fragment peptide on the surface on MHC2. If the cell on the right here is infected, right, then you would expect to see evidence of the pathogen just floating around inside the cytoplasm, not necessarily organized in special vesicles. So in this case, right, the pathogenic peptide or protein gets chewed up by the recycling bin, the proteasome, and then in the ER, the little red dot gets loaded up on MHC1, right? And then MHC1 presents this so that cytotoxic T cells can recognize this scenario, whereas helper T cells recognize the scenario on the left, right? And how does the CD4, CD8 T cell distinguish between these? Well, I just gave it away, right? It's because not only do they have T cell receptor, but they have this co-receptor, either CD4 co-receptor or CD8 co-receptor that will help out the T cell receptor when it's bound to something being presented on MHC. The co-receptor will identify and read what that MHC type is, right? And then only if that matches up will the T cell that's engaged here actually activate. So go back and review these three scenarios 
right? If you have an infected cell presenting, let's say viral proteins on MHC1, then if a CD8 cytotoxic T cell comes along and binds it, right? It's TCR happens to be the right three-dimensional shape to bind the red dot in the context of that red dot being displayed on MHC, right? That's how the T cell knows. It's actually contacting the red dot as part of that red dot still being presented by something and not just the red dot floating around by itself, right? Because think about this. If the red dot floated around by itself and bound to a TCR and activated it, right? What's this T cell gonna do, right? If, if in reality has no idea where this red dot came from, right? The T cell can't do its job. It can only get excited if the red dot is being presented so that the T cell knows what the target cell is that it should be doing something to. Right? So in this case, the CD8 co-receptor comes around and confirms, yes, indeed, this is MHC type 1 that's presenting it. So then the cytotoxic T cell will release its cytotoxic messages onto that cell, causing it to undergo apoptosis and die. Right? In these scenarios, the second and third one here, we have an immune cell like a macrophage or a B cell with its immunoglobulins binding to and taking in uh, protein evidence of the pathogen, right? And so in both of these cases, they're loading up the little red dot on MHC2, right? So if a CD8 cell, CD8 cytotoxic cell came along, even if the T cell receptor of the CD8 cytotoxic T cell bound here, right? Uh, it's CD8 co-receptor would not see MHC1 because this is MHC2, that purple cytotoxic T cell would then just fall off and go off somewhere else, right? Oh, but here comes the blue, the light blue CD4 helper T cell. Its T cell receptor recognizes the red dot and its CD4 co-receptor confirms this is MHC2 that's displaying the red dot. So now this helper T cell does its helpful job, right? It releases cytokines, either these cytokines here that stimulate the macrophage to increase its activity, or these green cytokines here that then stimulate this B cell to activate, make many copies of itself. And some of these copies then become plasma cells to release the antibodies, okay? Uh, we took a close look at MHC one and two to better understand the significance of these. We said that these MHC platforms are made of human leukocyte antigens, HLAs, and those HLAs, right? We have different ones, HLA A, B, C, E, F, G, that all code for proteins that can make different versions of MHC class one. All the cells in your body, right? Display MHC one on their surface in a mix of all six of these different types of MHC one coming from these different HLA, A, B, C, E, F, G genes that you got from your mom and dad, right? The HLA D genes make the, um, make the alpha and beta chains that make the uh, MHC class, class two platforms, right? And again, you have many different types of HLA D genes, right? You have the six uh, class one genes. And when they were first discovered, uh, researchers were studying the fact that why is it that certain patients reject um, donated tissue, right? They traced it back to these genes here. So they called this big complex of genes, the major histocompatibility complex, right? And it's all on chromosome six. Um, and that's why we call these MHC platforms, but to be more specific, they're made of these HLA genes. Right? And the very last slide of our review today is the significance of this, right? Because these HLA proteins are so polymorphic Right? some of the most polymorphic genes in the human species in our genome, that's because the more variations, subtle variations of the shapes of these MHC platforms, right, the more successful you are in being able to present different peptide parts of a particular pathogen. Remember the cartoon of the chicken, right? Yeah, I love that cartoon. It's silly, but it's actually very effective. We said the chicken, if it represents a protein from a pathogen that's inside the cell and the chicken gets broken down by the proteasome, right? The different parts of the chicken, the head, the wing, the feet, the tail, et cetera, right? Represent small little peptides, right? The better job or the better that this cell can succeed in displaying each one of these different parts of the chicken, the greater chance of waking up different T cells that have unique T cell receptor, right? That recognize the head or the wing or the feet or the tail. 
right? So as a species, the more diverse shapes MHC that we have, the greater chance of our species surviving a major global pandemic, right? Because in that example of the chicken, if you were just limited to being able to present chicken foot and chicken drumstick, right? And those are the only two that the MHC's proteins that you have were good at hanging on to because the other things like the chicken uh, wing and the chicken butt, right? Aren't carried around very nicely by the MHC, right? You are at a great loss in terms of being able to effectively activate any T cells that come by, right? T cells that are looking for those other signals, right? So I said this interesting thing that you are born with your set of polymorphisms. You got them from mom and dad. You are set, right? Your whole life, you already have whatever, whatever polymorphisms you got as part of your ancestry, right? So having a good combination of HLA polymorphisms, a hey, good for you, right? But you might have a bad combination of polymorphisms that maybe are not as good as displaying different peptide products from something like SARS-CoV-2, right? So maybe your MHCs only display a subset of little proteins from SARS-CoV-2. That means you can only hope to activate T cells in your body that happen to recognize those uh, little uh, bits of evidence. Whereas somebody else, your friend, right, who comes from a very different family, maybe he or she has other polymorphisms, oh, that can display a wider range of peptides that come from SARS-CoV-2 on their surface. That means what? That means their immune system can actually activate many different types of T cells that recognize these different signals in their system. They may have a better, more effective immune response, right? So that's why on an individual level, you kind of luck out or you're screwed just by what you're born with, but these polymorphisms at a species level, right? Keeps our species surviving. Even if that means sadly your friend lives and you don't, right? At least they go on and they are the future of the human race, right? Oh yeah, that's kind of deep, right? Okay, but anyhow, so the way we presented it is that's why these HLA polymorphisms are responsible for tissue being rejected from a donor into a recipient's body, right? Because if your HLA types are very different, then the donor's tissue itself, even though it's healthy tissue, a healthy kidney that your body needed, and so it was transplanted into you, the problem is all of those kidney cells have their type of HLA on their surface, right? And your body was never designed to anticipate that, right? Uh, which is fascinating to think about, right? Mother nature never intended you to get somebody else's kidney. So that means after hundreds of millions of years of evolution, vertebrate evolution, vertebrate evolution that gave rise to mammals and you, never once was mother nature concerned about, hmm, this would be a problem if I got somebody else's kidney in me, right? Because that's never something that naturally was supposed to happen, right? So that's interesting to think about as we move beyond the first exam and eventually start talking about things like tissue transplantation, okay? All right. So that's the end of our um, review. Let me go ahead and stop this.